at Kadosik says, Hey, Aging Wheels, can you please do a video on the tools you use? I know you're a big Ryobi guy. I'm getting more into working on cars and would like to know what you use. What? I'm a big Ryobi guy. What gave you that idea? Oh, I think I get it. Yeah, sure. Let's talk about my tools. What I have, why I have it, and maybe I'll give you some useful tips and recommendations along the way. Although I doubt it, because what do I know? Let's start out with basic hand tools. Wrenches, sockets, ratchets, and the like. I keep all of mine in this mobile tool car here. I only bought this thing last month, and that's a huge shame because I should have had this for years because this thing is a massive time saver. Instead of spending all of my time going back and forth from whatever car I'm working on to the toolbox to get one socket, and then having to go back to the toolbox because I got the wrong size socket the first time, and then ending up at the end of a job with a pile of ratchets and sockets and everything in random places all over the shop, I can just wheel this over to wherever I'm working, grab whatever I need out of it, use it, and as soon as I'm done using it, I can put it right back where it belongs so I don't end up with tools scattered all over the shop. Even if you work in just a one-car garage, I'd highly recommend picking up a mobile tool cart like this. And by the way, if you're wondering where I have got it, well, that should be patently obvious. As for what's in this toolbox, I've got it all nicely organized. All my sockets and ratchets are a craftsman set that I got way back in college. These bits over here are from Harbor Freight, and these are from Lowe's. They're the Cobalt brand. They're my impact sockets. And my wrenches are, vast majority of them are metric. They're all craftsmen as well. And I do have a set of Imperial tools over here because you never know when you're going to need Imperial tools. Up here, I've got some screwy bits. And here is just various ratchet socket accessories, axle nuts for when I need them, an oil filter wrench, and some spark plug wrenches, stuff like that. And also a power thing to drive them. Over here in the corner, I have these two toolboxes full of hand tools and various other things. These were given to me by my parents for two different Christmases because what do you get the person that has everything? A place to keep their everything. Over here above my basic but functional workbench, I have a tool wall with even more hand tools on it. And I really like this tool wall approach for my wood shop. But in here, it doesn't make as much sense. This shop is a little bit too decentralized for this approach to be efficient. I rarely do any actual work here at the workbench. So these tools end up, well, I end up taking them off and then just scattering them around the shop somewhere and never putting them back properly. So I think in the future, I'm going to rebuild this workbench, replace it with something that's a bit nicer looking and has drawers in it and get rid of this tool wall entirely. Over time, I've collected a small number of specialty tools. Each task requires a different set of tooling. I've got a small collection of axle nut sockets here that I bought basically for one job and then never used again, although it's not money thrown away because these are very useful to beat on stuff with. More specialty tools on the shelf over here. I've got a vacuum pump and manifold gauge that I bought for installing mini splits, which I've done a few times now. Below that is, I don't remember. I've got an ultrasonic parts cleaner here that doesn't work very well. Below that is a crankshaft bearing puller tool thing that I bought for disassembling the Saab V4 engine and then never used again. Here is a bearing splitter set that I bought from Harbor Freight. Don't remember what I bought it for, but I'm sure it was very useful. Below that is the front end service kit. So tie rod separators, ball joint separators, whatever. I bought that for the Yugo and it already served me very well. It scared the crap out of me, but it served me very well. And below that is a giant soldering iron that I have barely used. In this dark chasm behind me is my wood shop. Lots of interesting tools to talk about in there, some of which I improved or made entirely myself, but that's a discussion I'll leave for a video on my second channel. I'll keep this video focused on automotive related tools or just whatever's in my main shop. I do have two benchtop DC power supplies. This one's branded as a TAC Life. It maxes out at 30 volts and 10 amps. I bought it off Amazon. I'll have a link in the description to that. I do recommend it. This one, I don't remember the brand name on. It maxes out at 150 volts at two amps, and I paid nothing for it. This was accidentally sent to me. I have no idea how a mistake like that happened. It's not like it was sent in place of something I was supposed to get. It was sent in a completely separate box alongside something else that I actually did order. I don't even know where you'd buy one of these things, but free DC power supply, and it's rated 150 volts, so that's pretty cool. It'll be cool until it burns my shop down, but right now I'm grateful. I do have a shop press. This was a very easy purchase to justify because I got it specifically for removing and installing wheel bearings in the WeGo. If I were to hire a mechanic to do that same job, it would have cost just about as much as this whole machine. So I bought this and did it myself, and it has come in handy much more times than that. 
Tucked away over here in the corner is a lift height transmission jack that Alec from Technology Connections bought me to work on his little Nissan Figaro, and an engine hoist that I bought for obvious reasons, to lift my spirits. No wait, that's not it. Underneath my shoddily built workbench is an engine stand that I've used all of once. I used it for the Saab V4 and a parts washer back here, and both of these came from, you guessed it, Harbor Freight. Now, Ryobi. Why Ryobi? I get asked this question fairly often, which I find odd because I have Bosch tools in my wood shop and nobody asked me about those. I suspect it's because they're not lying green enough. First of all, I am not sponsored by or affiliated with Ryobi in any way, shape, or form, at least as of right now. That may change in the future, but as of right now, no affiliation. So why do I have so many of these bright green tools? Well, three main reasons. In general, Ryobi tools are cheap, or at least cheaper than their counterparts. The quality of them overall is generally just fine, and they have a vast selection of tools that all use the same 18 volt battery. Ryobi tools are made by TTI, Tectonics Industries, based out of, I believe, Hong Kong. They also have a headquarters in one of the Carolinas. I don't remember if it's north or south. Doesn't matter. It's a company that also makes rigid tools, AEG everywhere else in the world, Milwaukee, Homelight, Hoover, Dirt Devil, and a bunch of other brands. Now, in the United States, Ryobi tools are exclusively sold at the Home Depot, as are the orange-lined rigid tools. And the way they have it set up, in general, is Ryobi occupies the low tier, the mid tier is occupied by rigid, and the upper tier is occupied by Milwaukee. But obviously, the separation is not that cut and dried. There are quite a few Ryobi tools that comfortably fit into that low tier category, typically ones that have a counterpart from Milwaukee, like these five here. This six and a half inch circular saw is great. I love it, it was very cheap and I use it all the time, but objectively, it's kinda on the weak side. This brushed cordless angle grinder is one step above a toy. This thing is so weak and it cuts out all the time. This is probably the worst Ryobi tool I own, but at least it was kinda cheap. It's not really much of a bonus when you can't use the thing. This metal cutting portable bandsaw is great. I love this thing, I use it all the time, but the Milwaukee versions are going to be better. First of all, Milwaukee offers their portable bandsaws in more than one size. This two and a half inch opening here gets a little bit restrictive at times and I have no other options. And the Milwaukee versions have a variable speed trigger. This one is an on off switch, which kind of bugs me. But despite that, I still love this thing and I use it all the time. This drill I bought for $25 out of a bargain bin from a Ryobi approved retailer. And there's nothing wrong with it. It'll probably last you a long time just kind of a basic drill. This is a half inch impact wrench. It has a brushed motor and that's an awful lot of current to be sending through some brushes on a thing like this. So every time you pull the trigger, you smell the carbon coming off the brushes, which is a little bit disconcerting. And this thing's only rated for 300 pound feet of torque, which when you're talking about comparing this to other half inch cordless impact wrenches is really on the low side. This is one of the lowest torque options available. But that's okay, because last year Ryobi announced a new brushless half-inch cordless impact wrench, and today I went out and bought it. This one's rated for 600 pound-feet of torque, so it'll be substantially more useful. And a few months ago they announced another one that's rated for 1,200 pound-feet of torque, so my qualms there have completely vanished. Then there's the tools, like these here, that not only don't have a Milwaukee equivalent, they don't have any equivalent that I'm aware of, this finger sander, for example, it's got a little thin belt on here. It's the only cordless electric finger sander, sander that I'm aware of existing. There's tons of pneumatically powered ones, and there's a few available as corded electric finger sanders, but this is the only cordless one I've ever seen, which is a shame because finger sanders like this are incredibly useful, and having one that's cordless is almost a no-brainer. The cordless hot glue gun. This is the best hot glue gun I've ever used, hands down, regardless of power source and it uses a surprisingly small amount of battery, so you can actually get a useful lifespan out of this thing on just a one and a half amp hour battery. But it's no longer alone in the market anymore. Harbor Freight last year released their own cordless hot glue gun under the Bauer line of tools. So to the counter that, Ryobi released this little guy, a compact cordless hot glue gun. So how do you make this thing tinier and lighter but still use the same battery? Easy, they converted the base into a dock. 
So this thing still has a heating element in it, but it's only powered up when you set it in the dock. So it's useful if you want to set it on a desk and just pick it up and occasionally do something and set it back down. And to encourage you to set it back down to that base, it even has a little drip tray into the base to catch any of the hot glue that comes dripping out of the tip. I love this thing, and I think it's a great idea. And it's not very expensive either. I think this is $25. Cordless soldering station. This is my new favorite soldering station. Technically, Milwaukee does have an equivalent version of this. They have their M12 soldering pen, but it's a completely different form factor, so I'm gonna call it a different tool. I prefer this form factor, but that's just a matter of my opinion. And then down here on the floor, the debris sweeper, still powered by an 18 volt battery. You just kick the power button in the back, and the motors spin the brushes and sweep stuff into the bin in the middle. As you can probably tell by how filthy it is, I love this thing and I use it all the time. One of the most useful tools in my shop. There are equivalents on the market to this thing, but they're all unpowered. They're powered by the wheels as you push it along. So this thing is superior, but there's a problem with it. For whatever reason, Ryobi discontinued it. I was going to recommend you go out and buy these things because it's one of the best shop cleanup tools in existence but now good luck finding one. The quality of Ryobi tools can be a bit hit or miss, but if you know what to look for, you'll be just fine. In general, the two rules I follow are, don't buy out of the combo kits. About half the tools in those combo kits, especially the bigger ones, are just filler, AKA junk, like the five and a half inch circular saw. Thing's gonna be completely useless. And if Ryobi offers a tool in both brushed and brushless variety, get the brushless one, it's going to be a better tool. How much better depends on what it is. I've got a brushed circular saw and jigsaw, and they're both perfectly fine. I'm sure their brushless counterparts are even better, but the ones I have are just fine. But there's a pretty wide gap between the brushed angle grinder and the brushless anger grinder. This anger grinder, whatever. This one's basically a toy, and this one's a genuinely useful tool. And there's not a heck of a lot of difference between the brushed and brushless hammer drills, but I do say, and this is subjective, that I really like the feel and the sound of the motor of this brushless hammer drill. It's just too bad I dropped it on his chuck and bent it. One little top tip for you, TTI owns a line of factory outlet stores called Direct Tools. If you have one near you, you need to go check it out. They mostly sell Ryobi and Rigid Tools, but they also sell some Milwaukee stuff in there as well. They have steep discounts in there all the time. And you can't check online, their online inventory is not at all reliable and not at all reflective of what's actually in the store. By going to that store, mine's about an hour away, I've saved hundreds of dollars. Or if you look at it a different way, I've spent hundreds of dollars on tools, but I've gotten some things at some pretty steep discounts. The least discounted thing I've gotten there was this brushless impact wrench that I bought today. It was only 10% off, but I've bought stuff for up to 50% off. And they have flash sales all the time, like store-wide 20% off, or this brushless impact driver today only is only $25. This brushless hammer drill, was $170. It came as a kit with a four ampere battery and a speed charger and everything. I got it for $100 because they had a flash sale on it. It's a pretty cool store to go to. You will save a lot of money, but you also uh, spend a lot of money. For full transparency, here's a representative of all the Ryobi tools I've had that have broken. As I already mentioned, this is the brushless hammer drill. I dropped it on its chuck and now the chuck is bent. Yes, this is my fault, but I'm still mentioning it. The only downside of that is now I can't really drill holes with it. The drill bit wobbles around just enough to make it not very good. I torqued on this ratchet too much and broke the drive pin inside. I did have a Ryobi reciprocating saw of this form factor last year, but it broke while I was using it. Some of the teeth of the bevel gear inside sheared off. Don't know what I did to cause that, but that happened and I had to chuck the tool. And the most disappointing failure of all of them was last year, I had a 14 inch 40 volt chainsaw and it just up and died one day. I picked it up, pulled the trigger, Nothing happened. Something died on the circuit board. I tried taking it apart, see if I could find any stains on the circuitry. Found nothing. Just had to chuck a couple hundred dollar tool and that was very disappointing. On the upside though, I got this 16 inch chainsaw this year and it's actually an upgrade. It has better trigger response and it's more powerful. If you're looking at getting into the Ryobi ecosystem and don't know where to start, I highly recommend the Compact Brushless Series Drill and Impact Driver Combo Kit. Yes, this is one combo kit that I do recommend. You get the compact drill, you get the compact Im impact driver, two batteries and a charger all for about, I think it was $160. I love these things. Because of their small size, they're very nimble and they're not lacking in power whatsoever because of the brushless technology in here. And they come with two one and a half amp hour batteries. Kind of limiting for other tools, but for these tools, 
perfectly fine. However, if you are going to upgrade to a more power hungry tool like this one hander reciprocating saw, I highly recommend jumping to a four amp hour battery because a one and a half amp hour battery isn't going to get you much run time. I also have some Milwaukee tools. These two, a screwdriver and a ratchet. And I know what you're thinking. Why do you have that Milwaukee ratchet if you also have the Ryobi ratchet? Well, that's an easy question to answer. I accidentally broke this one. Yep, there's a little pin in here, a little metal pin that rotates around and moves this ratchet head back and forth. That's how it works. Well, I torqued on this too hard and broke that little pin off. Oh, whoops. And before you say, see, Ryobi tools are junk, just know that this Milwaukee ratchet has exactly the same construction, nearly identical heads, and therefore the same vulnerability. I just now know to be a little bit more careful with this one and not torque on it so hard. So why, when this one broke, did I go to the Milwaukee ratchet instead of just getting another Ryobi ratchet? Well, it's because all these Ryobi tools use the same 18 volt battery, which in the case of this ratchet is a bit of a detriment. Look how unbalanced this tool is. And this huge battery lump got in the way all of the time. They tried to get around that by making this ratchet head swivel. So hopefully you can move the battery lump out of the way but it didn't quite do the trick. This Milwaukee tool, because it has the 12 volt battery, which is much smaller, has a much better form factor and is much easier to use. The downside of this Milwaukee ratchet is that it was $120, while this Ryobi one was $80. So this costs 50% more for no reason, other than it being red. These share a lot of design elements in common. And the reason I had this screwdriver here is because when I bought this ratchet, I needed some M12 batteries, and the screwdriver kit was the cheapest way I found to get two M12 batteries, a charger, and it came with a spare tool. So that was kind of neat. I also have these Snapfresh tools. Snapfresh is a tool brand that I believe exclusively sells on Amazon, and I paid for none of these things. I'm now up to four batteries, two reciprocating saws, three chargers, and this half-inch impact wrench here. Last year, some guy from the company sent me an email saying, hey, we want to send you a reciprocating saw for a video review or something. And I said, sure, here's my address. So they sent it to me. Several months went by, and I eventually did show this off on video very briefly when I was using it to take apart the steel frame on my homemade truck camper. And it did a fine job at that. It vibrates a lot, and it's not a very well-made reciprocating saw, but it did the job until I turned off the camera and then it broke. I don't know what broke inside of here, but this end moves freely. And when I pull the trigger, it's completely locked up. Something is catastrophically wrong inside of here. So it didn't last all that long. So I emailed the guy that sent me the tool and told him that, and he sent me a second one. I don't know what I'm gonna do with this, but we have a free reciprocating saw. And in addition to this, he also sent me this half inch impact wrench, which is surprisingly nice. It's brushless, it feels nice to hold, it's fairly light. But the problem with it is it's just too weak. Most of the time, this can't break off lug nuts. So unless you're doing light duty tasks with this thing, I can't really recommend it. Very briefly, my lawn and garden tool selection. I'm sitting on my electric zero turn mower. I love this thing. I'll make a video about it in the near future. I should say that I love it, but I don't recommend it for absolutely everyone. This is my little baby push mower over here. It's got a 13 inch wide deck. I got this specifically for mowing the ditches in my front yard. It's so small and light that I can basically lift it in and out of the ditches and it's faster than using a weed eater. Surprisingly, that thing runs on an 18 volt battery and I get 30 minutes of runtime from just a simple four amp hour 18 volt battery. It's pretty pressed at that. I've got all 40 volt tools over here. I've got a leaf blower, my 16 inch chainsaw and the brushless weed eater, all of which I absolutely love. And I have this bag. Is this a lawn and garden tool? I don't know, but it says Ryobi, so I'm gonna count it. Now let's start talking about my expensive tools, starting with the least expensive expensive tool, my mini metal lathe. I bought this thing earlier this year off eBay for a whopping $450. Now this thing is, let's say dubiously useful. For instance, it's powered by a DC motor. When you slow down the speed on the DC motor, the torque decreases as well. So you have to have this head spinning at a pretty good lick of speed in order for it to actually you know, do useful things. It doesn't have an, quite enough rigidity. This thing is quite a little chatterbox it is. And I thought I was upgrading it with this quick change tool post, but it turns out I was robbing a bunch of useful space from it. So now it's even more limited. That said, I have made some useful parts on it, as you would have seen if you watched my go-kart little project. I don't know if I'd buy this thing again, but I have gotten some use out of it. I have a MIG welder. Don't really have any opinions about it. 
As you can see, it's an Eastwood MiG-135. The only reason I got this specific welder is because this is the exact one that my dad has. So I had previous experience with it. As a result of me getting the same one as him, this is the only MiG welder that I've ever used. I mean, I like it. I guess that means I don't have any negative opinions about it, so that's good. I always use it with gas and never use it with flux core wire. The common methodology with buying tools is that you should buy tools when you need them for the job that presents itself, but with a MIG welder, that doesn't really apply because if you buy a MIG welder, you'll invent ways to use it for sure. Air conditioning. I don't know if you'd classify this as a tool, but regardless, I think this is an absolute necessity if you have any sort of indoor workspace, well, depending on your climate, of course. These are Pioneer Mini Splits, and yes, I do have a previous relationship with the company Pioneer. About three years ago, I sent them an email. I was a pretty small YouTuber then, so I was gracious to receive an email back. They sent me two of these mini splits for this shop for the price of one, and I do have an affiliate link down in the description if you want to pick one of these up yourself. I highly recommend them. I picked mini splits because they're super quiet, and they're also reversible heat pumps, so they act as heaters in the winter. But you could make do with any sort of window air conditioner or many other cheap alternatives. But don't skip out on air conditioning. If you get overheated, you're going to get frustrated. And if you get frustrated, you're going to start developing negative feelings toward whatever hobby you're working on in whatever indoor workspace you have. Get air conditioning. My lift! And here you thought I was the biggest tool in the shop. How silly you must feel. I bought this lift about five years ago while I was living at my last house because I moved in. The garage had 13 foot ceilings and that felt like an opportunity. So I bought and installed this lift and suddenly all my extra space went away. Weird how that works. I bought this thing from Northern Tool. It's a two post bend pack asymmetrical lift with a capacity of 10,000 pounds. And you probably want to know how much all this cost me. Like I said, I bought this thing about five years ago and I seem to remember the price being about $2,800. And I just looked on Northern Tool's website and an equivalent version of this lift now sells for just over $3,000, so that price seems about right. That was the price to buy the thing, and if I remember correctly, the shipping was free. I had it shipped to the store, then I drove to the store with a trailer, and they loaded it on my trailer via forklift, and I brought it home. Then I hired a lift installation company to come out and install it. They had a small crane on the back of their truck where they could lift everything in place. They bolted it to the concrete floor, checked to make sure the concrete floor was thick enough, bled the hydraulics, set the whole thing up and everything. And that whole process only cost me $800. Considering all the work they had to do, I thought that was a pretty good price to pay. But then I hired an electrician to come out and install a single 240 volt outlet to power this thing. And that job set me back $2,400, nearly what I paid for the entire lift. That was the exact moment that I decided to learn how to do basic wiring myself. And if that wasn't bad enough, when the lift install guys came back out to plug in the lift and bleed the hydraulics and everything, it tripped the breaker. Not the breaker for the lift, not the breaker for the sub panel in the garage, the main breaker for the entire house. So every time I'd hit the button on the lift, I would lose all electricity to my house. Turns out, not only was the main breaker panel in my house a bit on the old side, but it was under capacity for the new load that I had just added on to it. So on top of the previous electrical bill, I had to hire electricians to come out and replace the main panel in the house, sending me back another $1,100. Again, this was the moment that I decided to learn basic wiring myself. This was way more expensive to install in my scenario than it was to buy the thing initially. But ignoring that, after I moved to this shop, I paid the lift install guys again to move it, disassemble it from the last house and reassemble it here, and that was only another $800. Again, I thought that was pretty good. So, was it worth it? Well, I thought about this a lot over the past five years because it was not a cheap thing to get. Considering how big it is and how much steel's in it, it is pretty reasonably priced, but still not cheap at all. And I've decided that absolutely yes, it was totally worth it. Before I had a lift, all I could think about was how much easier these jobs would be if I had a lift. Now that I have a lift, I don't think about it at all. I've completely taken it for granted. It is the biggest convenience in my shop. So yeah, absolutely it was worth it. Now obviously I'm not recommending that all of you go out and buy a lift. I imagine the vast majority of you have absolutely no place to even think about putting a lift. But there is a suitable alternative also made by Benpack. It's the Quick Jack system. Two little 
parallelogram things that you roll underneath your car, have hydraulic rams in them, and they go whoop, lift your car two feet up off the ground. They can be rolled anywhere. They're only about $1,700. So if you have the means and you work on your cars, even a little bit, go out and buy some of those. I'll leave an Amazon link in the description for those. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, Stepcraft have sent me a CNC router, specifically an M1000, and this thing is incredible. Now, I've only had it for about a week, and I'm still getting to grips with not only the machine itself, but the whole CNC process, but I love this thing, and I'm going to be using it a heck of a lot over the next coming year. Huge thanks to Stepcraft for sending, this, the, sending me this machine, and a huge thanks to you all for watching these videos, because if no one watched these videos, well, things like this, they just wouldn't happen. And in conjunction with this CNC machine, I've gone out and bought a 3D printer, a Creality Ender 3 V2, if you're curious. And that thing has been printing pretty much nonstop since I got it. I've been printing all sorts of things, including things for this CNC router. I printed this drag link chain here. I didn't design this myself. This was designed by Marius Hornberger and I downloaded it off Thingiverse. And I have been dabbling in Fusion 360 3D modeling. Heck of a learning curve to that program. I have modeled myself and printed this dust shoe adapter and another adapter down to my dust collector here. And of course, I've been printing the collection of figurines, articulated slugs, benches, and things like that because well, of course, I've got a 3D printer now. I have to print stuff like that. And that's it. Well, except for this mini chainsaw. I don't know if this video had much purpose other than satisfying any curiosities that you may or may not have had, but thank you for allowing me to ramble on about my tools for half an hour. Been wanting to do that for quite some time. If you didn't like this video, that's alright, we'll be back to regular content in a week or two. Thanks for watching!